Avicinon was awesome, right? The best description for this hymn is just genius. That's what it is. Um, so Wednesday was a relatively quiet day. In fact, it was the quietest day of the Holy Week. And it was, uh, for the most part, a day of rest for our Lord Jesus Christ before the events of Holy Thursday and Friday. And the day is defined by those two events that you see on the screen. Judas on one side and the woman who anointed the head of Christ with the uh, uh, alabaster oil. Very precious. And if you have been paying attention to the readings of the day from the morning, especially the prophecies, you will find that there was a common theme in all the prophecies. And I will just go quickly through some of these prophecies just to give you a sense of what the prophecies are all about. First hour in the morning, Proverbs, and not be exalted in your own wisdom, be not wise in your own conceit. And from the wisdom of Sirach, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In the treasuries of wisdom are wise sayings. If you desire wisdom, keep the commandments. Third hour, Sirach, whoever teaches a fool, that's the opposite of wise, is like one, one who rouses a sleeper from deep slumber. Whoever tells a story to a fool, tells it to a drowsy man. Proverbs, for I teach you the ways of wisdom, and I cause you to go in the right path. Ninth hour, from Proverbs, wisdom sings aloud in passages and in the broad places speaks boldly. For they hated wisdom and did not choose the word of the Lord, neither would they attend to my counsels. Eleventh hour, Jeremiah, my people knows not the judgment of the Lord. How will you say, we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? The wise men are ashamed and alarmed and taken because they have rejected the word of the Lord what wisdom is there in them? Clearly, the church is very focused on one thing, which is wisdom. Why? Because today, we see those two examples. Two different people, two different versions of wisdom. Every one of them knows or believes what he is doing is wise. Judas on one side, and the woman who broke the flask of alabaster on the head of Christ. Clearly, Judas was convinced that he's wise, and so is the lady. So the question now is, who is right? Was it Judas, or was it the woman? And I know if I quiz you guys here, everybody will say the woman was right, because we hate Judas, right? But actually, the answer is not that simple. We'll go quickly through the two personalities, the two characters, and see what's behind their actions of this day, and see w what version of wisdom is closer to my vision or my understanding. Let's start with Judas. Judas was a, a very complex character that just by reading the Gospels, we don't understand what's the motives behind. We understand partially what are some of his motives, but we'll see that um, he, he was a very interesting person. For each of those personalities, for the two of them, I will go through three attributes of the personality that were visible to us tonight. The first part of Judas, the first attribute, is his love of money. Judas was a very analytical guy, and he loves numbers, especially those numbers that are preceded by the dollar sign. If you notice, and it's here on the screen for you, when he went and met with the high priests, he asked them the question very clearly, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? How much are you going to pay? For everything in his mind, the question of how much money? When he was in charge of the box and collecting uh, donations for the ministry, that was his job. How much? How much? How much? 
Everything for him is equal to money. Time equals money. Friendship equals money. If I am loyal to you, it's because of my love for money. With that wisdom or with that foolishness? That's a question. And the interesting thing that this love of money and the fact that he was stealing from uh, the donations, it wasn't manifested tonight. Why? Because when he talked to the high priest, they offered him how much? 30 pieces of silver. I did some math, and you can do it. You can Google and figure this out. When you do all the math in the world, you will figure out that that woman, when she broke that flask of alabaster or spikenard, the price of that perfume was in the order of multiples of tens of thousands of dollars. And we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Maybe $50,000, we'll, we'll talk about that. If you look for the price of Christ, it was in the order with today's currency, 100 to 400 dollars. It's one hundredth of what that woman had spent on Christ. Which raises a question, if you are the money guy, if you always count everything by the dollar sign, why did you do that? And that actually is a mystery. And a lot of people try to attempt to understand why. And most of the scholars believe that it wasn't just money that drove him to the decision to go and deliver Christ, but it was his vision for who Christ should be. In his mind, he started following Christ and be one of the disciples because he thought that Christ will lead him, will, will, will be, end up being a king of, the king of Israel. And in that kingdom, he will have a high position, maybe the secretary of treasury or something, since he was in charge of, of the donation box. But over time, he found out that that's not going to happen. Every now and then, Christ would make it clear that his kingdom is not from his world. And sometimes he hears Christ saying, you have to carry your cross and follow me. What does this mean? I'm looking for a king. I'm looking for someone who will achieve my ambitions and move me up in the society. And over time, he didn't see that. And clearly, the events of that, of that week, this is what the climax of it, when Christ got into arguments with the high priests and with the scribes and Pharisees in the temple. So in his mind, at that moment, he felt that Christ has to go. Christ has to go because he's not achieving his purpose. When his ambitions and his interest in life would contradict with the vision of Christ, that led him to believe that it's time for Christ to go. Otherwise, I will be forever, till the end of my life, stuck with that person. And we all see that in our lives. Sometimes when our spirituality or our Christianity or our Christ would contradict with my ambitions in life or my next career move, I'm willing to just say to, to, to God, just stay away on the sideline for now. Again, was that wisdom or foolishness? And then the last part of what we knew about Judas tonight is his opinion about, is it good or this was a waste to put all this money on the feet or on the head of our Lord Jesus Christ with what the woman did? And actually the argument makes sense. Until today, until the end of ages in the church, we'll be arguing about the same thing. Should we be serving the poor more or should we be building more or expanding churches or decorating churches? It's, it's a question that will remain there for eternity, but who cares about what you think, Judas? Who cares? It's what God wants, what God wants, and I'll be talking about that in a little bit with the woman also. But the point here is the attitude of Judas sometimes it's not different from ours. His own version of wisdom is not different from ours. Now, let's, look, took, uh, look about, let's talk about that woman. She came out of nowhere, and she brought that thing, 
and it's worth 300 dinaris. And uh, there are two things that we know from the Bible. Um, we know that at that time, one dinari was the wage of one worker a day. So that's a wage or a salary for some worker for an entire year, right? Not only that, we, when uh, Christ was about to feed the, the people, they told him there are 5,000 people in addition to the children and, and the woman, and it will take 200 dinaris to feed all these people. So it takes 200 dinaris to feed more than 5,000 people. 300 dinaris means you feed somewhere between 7,500 and, and uh, 10,000 people. Do the math, we are talking about big money. What made her do that? And when you read it, the Bible was very particular. She broke the flask and what went into her mind to put, I don't know, $50,000 and put it into waste? This will be, uh, will create a good smell for a day or two, maybe some hours, and then what? Why did you do that? Have it to do, don't you have kids to feed? Don't you have needs? Don't you have, want to upgrade your house? But she didn't calculate it this way. She didn't care. Was that foolishness or was that wisdom? And by doing that, she opened herself up to criticism. If you notice, clear, if you notice clearly, it wasn't just Judas Iscariot who criticized her, but the Bible tells us, as we read in the third hour, that the disciples criticized what she did. Imagine that you are pouring your heart into the service, into building the kingdom of God, and people around you and people who serve with you saying, oh, what are you doing? Why are you, are you wasting your time? That's exactly what she had to go through. She opened her up, up for criticism despite all what she had in her heart. But she didn't care. She didn't care. Was that foolishness or was that wisdom? And one more thing. It was very clear, it was no secret to anyone at that time that the things have escalated between Christ and the high priest to the point of no return. It was very clear. Even the disciples, before they went to Jerusalem, they said, let's go and die with him. And the events of Palm Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday didn't help. So it was very clear that Christ is going to be crucified, and he himself talked, significant, talked repeatedly about that. So by doing what she did, she actually put her life in danger. Why? Because she is now known, and people can be spying to the high priest and telling them that this woman is an avid follower of Christ. You can take it a step further. If the Jews decided to go and arrest Christ on that day, in that location in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, she would have been probably killed or arrested with him. She sacrificed a lot, not just money, but even she could have been killed on that day. Tomorrow we'll be talking about Peter, who when, when the thought of when the thought of just being a follower of Christ by a servant, he was denying and cursing and doing, doing all sorts of stuff. But she, she didn't care. Was that foolishness to even sacrifice or put her life in danger? Or was that wisdom? That's a question. We have to understand the motive behind what she did is she understood something that Judas didn't understand. And that is... Spiritual life is about opportunities. Who knows when else can I do that for Christ? Christ is about to die, and this is my chance to honor him and give him my best. If you notice the Marys, who later wanted to come after a crucifixion early Sunday morning, they wanted to do exactly the same thing. But Christ was raised and the opportunity was gone. She elected to do that because she wanted to offer 
her best to Christ. I'll go back to where I started. Today was a quiet day for our Lord Jesus Christ, and it should be likewise for us. We are here to follow the steps of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today should be a quiet day. And it's a quiet day because it was a confrontational day. You feel that those two, two descriptions wouldn't, wouldn't match quiet, but confrontational. It's confrontational because it puts us against ourselves. It's actually a very tough day. I used to think before that Monday is the toughest of the Holy Week because it exposes our um, hypocrisy and lack of, fruit, uh, lack of fruit in our lives despite our good appearance. But Wednesday actually is a very tough day because it puts us against ourselves to decide for us what does wisdom mean for us. And this is my plea to you tonight. It was a quiet day, and we need to continue the day in a quiet fashion. Number one, please shut down all your distractions. Shut down all distractions, and we all know what these are. Number two, I encourage you to all, and me, myself, before anybody else, to examine ourselves and our lives and see what version of wisdom are we living by. As I mentioned early on, it's very easy to say, yes, the woman is a wise one, but it's not that simple because when we compare and measure our lives and our actions and our deeds against um, those two, we will find interesting things in our lives. So please, let's take time tonight and think about that and examine our lives and examine our actions. And if you find yourself in a position like myself where I believe that my version of wisdom is closer to that of Judas rather than the woman, we have to be very concerned. Really, we have to be very concerned because we know the end of Judas versus the end of the woman. But don't just be very concerned and stop there. Be very concerned and put this in prayer. Tell God that tomorrow you offered yourself for us. You offered your body and blood for us. On Friday, you offered yourself up on the wood on the cross, and then you raised up from the dead all that to change our minds and to bring us forward as pure and as wise as you want us to be. Put this in prayer and ask God to change our mindset and our lifestyle to match those of our Lord Jesus Christ. And use what St. James said in his epistle, that if anyone lacks wisdom, should do what? Let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. This is one of the commandments with a promise. If you are lacking wisdom, ask of God, and he will give it to us. Ask for the heavenly wisdom of that woman as opposed to the earthly wisdom of Judas Iscariot, and may God bless us all. Amen.